Good morning, everybody. It's great to be gathered. There's a lot of buzz in the room, which is great. Good to be here. Uh, welcome, whether you're joining us uh, online. Um, great to have you with us. Um, whether you're here in the room this morning, uh, it's great to be gathered as God's people, however we come. Uh, before I forget, because um, I will, a um, couple of notable um, absences this morning. John Bremner is apparently back in hospital um, as with the after effects of COVID or whatever it was that went on for him. So just keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And also apparently John Bernard's in hospital as well. Um, no, but no, apparently he's gone back. Oh, he's gone back. I, so I don't, well, okay. Okay, let me just say this. All I know is that John Bernard was in hospital and he's a, either may well still be in hospital or he's home or, but John's not well, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. There you go. John Bernard's home. Okay, good. All right. He, maybe he's been in hospital. No, no. Let's assume John hasn't gone back. Let's assume John's watching online right now. And John, if you can type in, that'd be really helpful. Let me know. Send me a, ring me, message me, John, whatever. We just want to know you're okay. I'm sure he's fine. All right. Well, thanks to those of you who covered last week while I wasn't here. I know Mel may, may or may not be online and, um, and thank you, Loreen, for leading. Um, yeah, so it was a, I haven't had a chance to, to be part of last week's service. So if you missed last week's service online, it's now up because we had to hold it back just for a little bit, but it's there now uh, if you missed last week. This week is uh, Trinity Sunday. And, uh, and this is the, the week when we remember and explore perhaps the sense of our three-in-one God. So as we come to worship, let's uh, lay down all that's going on in our lives and let's take this time to let God speak to us, uh, to, to, to meet us and to, to guide and to call and to lead us as we leave from here today. Each, um, each week as we gather, we acknowledge country. So we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today, the Dharawal people. We pay respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of this land. Lord, may your work be done in reconciliation and justice. And each week we, uh, we light a candle we light our Christ candle. So I'm wondering if there's someone for whom lighting the Christ candle this morning would be an act of faith or hope or love or something you haven't done before and you'd like to have a go at, but you're a bit too scared to say, put your hand up. Anyone in that category? Thank you. Good on you, Alan. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And this, uh, this little liturgy comes from our reading, one of our readings this morning. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from darkness. As we light the Christ candle this morning, may the goodness of God shine within us. We're going to sing. Let's stand together. A voice is heard. Boys. 
Let's come to God in prayer. Father, parenting God, in these times of disconnect, of rush, of distraction, of self-importance, in these times where life often feels like a contest or a sale or a problem, where things are fixed by a professional, a program or a pill. God, draw us in this time to you to commune, to refresh, to restore. Jesus, in these times of brokenness, of pain, suffering, anxiety and fear, of people who are lost, disillusioned, broken, hurting, in need of a saviour, someone to help them through and to help them find life. God, draw us in this time to you to surrender, to hand over and to trust in you. Spirit, in these times of wandering, of meandering, of dryness, and feeling stale. Where people have lost their sense of connection in spirit or by spirit to you. God, draw us to hear your gentle call, leading us from beside to walk in the way shown to us by Jesus to walk and live in love. Triune God, three in one, be with us in these times, on this day we pray. Amen. Friends, if you're able, I invite you to stand. We're going to pass the peace. Brothers and sisters, put things in order. Find agreement with one another. Live in peace. My friends, may the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. And from where you are, I invite you to pass the peace with those around you. Those that are going out, the yes, um, the jam. People are going out. And David's going to bring us our reading this morning. Strap yourself in. It's a long one. Do you want the? Uh,
It's rare that we get a reading that comes right from the start of the scriptures. This one's really long, but it's an important story. It comes probably from an earlier Babylonian myth. Lots of ancient religions had creation stories. So if you choose, you might want to read it along on the screen with me, but sometimes it's better just to listen. The story can come to you a different way. This story is from Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept across the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. There was evening. There was morning. The second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation Plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning. The third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let there be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. 
God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. And over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. The second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sorry, just a, someone. No, someone just came in. I could see from there. Someone came in through the door, but they've now gone. I'm just sorry, I'm a little distracted as I stand up. Thanks, David. Um, last week, uh, Mel three times reminded you that this week was Trinity Sunday. I wasn't going to preach on Trinity. But, uh, but in watching uh, what she said, I then felt like I was um, sort of given, no, I really have to give her a writer a thank you letter to say that you're all up that I was going to preach on Trinity this week. And uh, um, here I am speaking on the Trinity, because um, I'll always do as Mel says. Um, you, you might have picked up last week, we're good friends. So. And, and as I was uh, lamenting a little bit with uh, Kyle and with Ron before sort of things, people started arriving, um, Ron sort of reflected that it's Trinity Sunday. You should have, there's so much material. There is so much material to preach on. Um, you shouldn't be short of anything to speak on on Trinity Sunday. And it's true. I could, I could um, preach this morning about, from the angle of the, the different bits of the work of the Trinity, I could talk about the creator God, the redeemer God, 
the sustainer God. I could talk about their intertriune relationship and what that means for us all. The Father, the Son, and the third person. Oh, the Spirit, that's right, yeah. I could talk about it from a historical place. I mean, I preached, I just preached, I spoke about this. Um, when did I speak on this? About four or five, six weeks ago at uh, Exploring Our Faith in the afternoon and looked at the he- historical development of the concept of the Trinity. And I could talk about the hypostases. Hypost- I always get that word wrong. But anyway, I, wrong or no, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the idea of the different persons of the Trinity, each having their own unique um, individual uh, presentation and that we experience all three of them a bit differently. I could talk about it from the idea of essence and all the arguments that went on in the first f- five, six, seven centuries of the early church, um, peaking in, in, uh, in Constantine with the, you know, like, like the Constantinople, sorry, with the, anyway, the, the, the Nicene Creed and all that sort of stuff and, and the difference between the Greek words homousis and homousius, the difference between of the same essence or of different essences and all the argument and the bullying and the shoving and the pushing and the arguing that went on to eventually bring us the creeds as we have them. And this idea perhaps too of a trinity, of a triune God. There's so much material And as I said to Ron, I'd only go into it if I wanted to speak for three or four hours and uh, if I was running a sleep clinic, you know what I mean? Like, like, because that's where we'd all end up. We wouldn't have any insomniacs in the room if I really got started on the Trinity from all those different angles. I promise you I'm not going to do that. I want to come at it from a different angle this morning. I want to come at Trinity from a different way. And the place I want to dwell this morning comes from the reading, Genesis chapter 1, where these words pop up in verse 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. What on earth did that mean to the ancient writer or writers of what we have now as Genesis chapter 1? I can't really fully explain that for you. When they were writing these these, um, parts of what we now, now know as scripture down, and, and as I've shared to you before, I actually want to tackle some difficult texts over coming weeks. And this would have been one of the ones I would pick as a difficult text because it's, it's been so lost in literalism in the church of what, re- what the writers are really trying to tell us. But I wonder what the writer meant when they said, let us make humankind in our image. And then in verse 27 it says, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them. Friends, I love this kind of spiritual truth that's there. This mystery that somehow we're created in the image of God. Is something that, that we can say quite easily, but something that, um, and, and I'm just going to get Kyle to put up for me, please, is something that we lean into, and this, this document comes from our own mission plan, right? So we name our vision as finding life through finding God, and we name our mission, in other words, the way we're going to do that is growing community and connection for all. And what you can't read, because it's way too small, is is just our our one-page summary, which lays out, 
our strategy and how we're going to go about all that, what sort of culture we're growing, what our goals are. The second page on our mission plan is a little bit hidden. We don't ever really talk about it that much, but it's this page. It's our mission foundations. And it's our starting point as God's as a community of faith. And the first column is about is these are four mission foundations. In other words, this is how we are going to go into the world. And our starting point, we're saying, as Coromel Uniting, is that we are going to allow ourselves to be captured by the awesome. We're not going to be a group of people who have got all the answers and can nail God down and explain God to you or fix it up like a Rubik's Cube. God's not like that. God's not a puzzle. God's not a crossword. God's not a Sudoku. God's not a problem with your car that you can fix up with technical issues, technical fixes. God is, an, is a mystery that we can get to know in part. We will always be captured by the awesome. The second thing we say about ourselves is that we will be a sent people. We're not going to be a stuck people. That's the opposite to being sent. We're not going to be stuck by the building or this room. We are God's sent people, sent into our community, following in the way of Jesus. The third one is the image of God. And we say this about who we are as we are in mission that we see each person as created in the image of God. And I'll just keep going back, Kyle, sorry, because um, I want just, just want to go to the fourth one before I go any further. I'll come back to that. Actually, we'll go to the fourth one and then I'll come back to the third one. So the last one, and this is one of my favourite passages out of Scripture, on earth as it is in heaven. So as God's people who, who are trying to be caught by God's mystery, God's awesomeness, being sent people, seeing each person made in the image of God, we are seeking on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're saying about ourselves as we engage in mission. Now, I want to go to the image of God one. Carl, I'll get you to put that up. Thank you. He's, he's blown this up for us, all right? So what it says is this. In the image of God, it says, we see each person as created in the image of God. And as such, we are all lovable, valued, and cherished. In ministry and mission, we see people as people to be met, not problems to be fixed. Now, if you haven't quite caught that yet, if that jars for you, then I'm inviting you to think about it and pray about it. Because we're naming this as an important part of who we are as God's people here. And I'm asking the question again, what might it mean to be made in the image of God? I'll get you to go with the rest of the slide now, Carl. Thank you. This is just going to be a rolling slide. These are all a few things I'm just going to let keep rolling through as I'm speaking. What might it mean to be made in the image of God? What I'm going to do for the rest of my time is lean into a theologian by the name of Geoffrey of Damascus. Gregory of Damascus, sorry. Gregory. There were no Jeffs around then. Gregory of Damascus, 8th century theologian, who came up with this idea. Now, theology, Trinity, Trinitarian theology is concept. It's how do we try and capture what God might be like in Trinity. But he came up with this sort of thinking that I really love. And it's, he calls it, and, the, and these are all different images of it, but it's called the divine dance. That's probably the only one that isn't in my slides, the divine dance. That's just another picture for Trinity. But he called about this idea of the dance of the divine. In the Greek, it's perichorosis. This concept that the Trinity is a dance, that the Trinity, the essence of God, is love, 
and is community. And that's what each of these images are hopefully helping you to catch. That God as Trinity can well be understood as God as community. God as common unity. God as common purpose. God drawing us together in mission. I love this way of thinking about Trinity because a lot of theology that, we, that, that we've developed over the last four or five hundred years sometimes has members of the Trinity pitted against each other. One requiring violence against another so that there can be relationship. True Trinitarian theology is more like this where God has common unity and common purpose. There's this three in oneness about God. Now we live in a world and we live in times, particularly in Western society, which values individuality and individualism. We've all become individual units of consumption. And for a lot of places, a lot of people, that's what our value is. How much can you buy? We've all become individual units of democracy and it's your vote. We've all become individual units of mentality and emotion. And we're measurable. And that's what psychology is about. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, that there's no room for psychology. I use it as a tool quite regularly myself. But I'm just saying the danger is, is when we individualise people and only see people as individuals, I think we're moving away from this idea of community, of Trinity, of the Trinitarian God that we hold to. We live in times, and let me say, individualism works for some, but it fails for many. There are so many people who get left behind when individualism reigns. We live in a world where the epidemic is loneliness and social isolation. That's the danger of living in an individualistic society, is we end up believing that we are all we need. Now I know people who think they can, would do just fine without other people if, if their lives didn't have to interact with too many other people. And I, I get that. There are days when I feel like that too. Luckily it's not Sunday mornings. But I want to draw out this distinction. You see, loneliness can hit most of us. Most of us at different times feel a bit like we're on our own. At different times. But the real danger in our world, in Western world in particular, is social isolation. Now in my previous role, when I was working at Wayside, we came to a point where we were starting to kind of try, like there were a number of different presenting factors in people's lives. Homelessness, mental health, unemployment, um, um, poverty, um, race, there's a whole range of different things. Um, we, had an, we had an Aboriginal program, we had a youth program, we had a whole range of things going on. Unemployment, like it was, we were all, and we were spreading far and wide trying to work out um, drugs, addiction, another big one. And, at, and in my time there, I was given the role of trying to, work, trying to work on our advocacy agenda. In other words, what would our main leading voice be in public life? And I went and met with um, peak bodies, housing, unemployment, 
um, employment, um, other religious institutions, mental health organisations. I met with peak body heads in New South Wales and had conversations about all these things. And the one thing that became so clear, and it's the thing I hope, I hope you've picked up, I've carried with me to Coromel. is that the, what's causal and what's correlation is hard to determine in all those kind of things. Unemployment, addictions, uh, mental health, what, what causes what? What's, all, what, what's the common factor that, that carries, what's, what, what's the causal factor of people falling into those things? Hard to know because people have different pathways in. All, there's a whole range of different pathways into any of those kind of issues when they land on your life. But the one thing that is so clear, it's clearer than anything, it's, it's as clear as day, is that what you will experience when any of those things is going on in your life, the common experience you will have, whether it's unemployment or addiction, whether it's mental health or, or, or being homeless or having trouble finding housing, the common thing that you will experience with every other person going through the same sort of stuff is social isolation. And social isolation works a bit more, bit more insidiously than just those two words. Because how social isolation works is that it actually, it's not just that you get, get cordoned off, it's that things start to work against you. You don't have the money to go to the pub to have a lunch with your friends or a cafe to have a coffee with your friends anymore. You don't have the clothing or the, um, you, you don't, you, when, you, when you don't have a home, how do you carry on a relationship with somebody? And people start to not see you but see the problem. When you're homeless, they see you as a problem. When you have a mental health issue going on in your life, when you go through one of those troughs, people see you as a problem that they can try and fix up. When you've got an addiction of some description, you are a problem. And people, del people unconsciously sometimes, often, but deliberately will cordon you off. And it acts in its own way, social isolation. It's not just, I'm ex I feel socially isolated. What you feel is loneliness. But you will also feel excluded. People will see you and make either conscious or unconscious judgments about you, about how you got to be there, about what is going on for you now and about what you should do about it. Friends, does that sound like God? I hope not. I hope in your mind that, does sound, that sounds nothing like God excluding, cutting people off, making judgments. You see, if we're made in the image of God, if each and every one of us are made in the image of God, and if we're made in the image of God in the way that um, Gregory of Damascus helps us to find, then friends, we are designed and made to be in community. We're designed in the image of God to work for common purpose. We're designed in the image of God to find our mission together, to find God's mission of love together. On Wednesday night, um, a few of us gathered for that terrible event, the State of Origin, right? <laughs> I don't know why we bother. And I'm the one that advertises it, so I'm the worst case offender. But we got together, and about seven or eight of us were here. Um, and fortunately, the one Queensland supporter amongst us who usually comes didn't make it, all right? So, but what happens is we have a meal together and then we watch the game. And sort of near the end of the meal, I don't know, there's others of us in the room are here, right? And you, you might remember this, you may not. But in the middle of, of coming near the end of the meal, and a couple of the guys had come from ends meet, all right? A couple of the ends meet guys had come along to watch the game with us, right? 
and one of them who, who experiences social isolation. He lives a bit in poverty. He's, um, you know, he's got a couple of mental health things going on. He'd had a couple of drinks before he got here. So he's a bit happy. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about myself. I need a, I don't drink very much, but I, I can make alcohol drink jokes, but I won't. Um, and he popped up in the middle, of the, right near the end of the meal, and he said this, something along these lines. He said, this is good. It's good to be with others. This is how it's meant to be. That was all he said. Kind of. Well, that, was, that wasn't all he said on the night, but that was, that was kind of like... That, that was, I caught this at the end of the meal. This is good. We're talking about someone who probably eats most of his meals on his own. And he could spot the goodness in what we were doing. The inclusiveness of having a meal together. The inclusiveness of not worrying about background, not making judgments. Not deciding who's in or out. Friends, that's the image of God that we're made in. I guess if I ask, well, I'm going to conclude. And what I want to say is this is that if all we do in common unity together as Coromel Uniting, and if all you do when you are a sent person, because maybe you can't, get, you can't get involved in the programs we run in the middle of the week or on the weekends, that's okay. I'm sending you with this same word. If all we do as people of God in community together, or when we're sent out, is to combat social isolation by loving people and including them and embracing them for who they are, not for who we want them to be. Then look, friends, we are living in this spirit of the triune God. That's that's us living the Trinity. It's an activity. It's community. This idea that we hold in God's mission that we are going to live and work aiming for community, aiming for connection, aiming for inclusion. Well, friends, I believe that's enough. We're living it. We're doing it. And we meet people all the time. Whether it's at op shop, men's shed, ends meet, time out, the community garden, whether it's um, Living English, the art group, that's going again, going really well. I feel like I've missed one. Craft. I think I'm still missing one. But in all of those things, if all we are doing is combating social isolation, then we are living out what it means to be a triune people. People who hold to some sense of trinity. Ooh, trinity. In many ways, when we do this, we are celebrating and upholding that everybody is created in the image of God. All of us, when we are a loving, common unity, including and embracing. And friends, my prayer for you is that this triune God, if you need it today, then my prayer for you is that this triune God will hold you and embrace you and remind you how valuable you are, created in the image of God. 
created for community, created to love. You're valuable. You're worth it. Amen. We're going to sing. I invite you to stand. Sorry, that's right, now some first. Just want to say, Barbara has made no mention here. So Barbara and Di aren't here this morning either. And I saw um, Di earlier in the week. He's doing okay, I think, last I heard. On behalf of our church council and our teams of elders and pastoral carers, we welcome all to share with us in worship today, uh, here in the room, and especially... Uh, those further afield, afield watching online. Uh, our new sheet has been prepared for us. Uh, lots of information about the items that are going on in our congregation um, throughout the week. A special little mention that this afternoon right here in our Coromel base, uh, Exploring Our Faith, is again meeting. Um, a couple of very interesting topics listed there, um, exploring the uh, uh, views of John Calvin and, uh, and also the early Christian denominations up to where we find the Christian church operating today. Uh, also that um, this week, Time Out will be, be meeting uh, here in this session. They meet first and third Tuesdays, so uh, next Tuesday is one of those. Uh, lots of items going through uh, what we're doing and uh, I will leave our new sheet to people. We're, as always, of course, uh, our friends online, uh, please get in touch with us at admin at um, so that we can send our documentation and other things to share with you. So at that point, I'll hand over to Far for um, our prayers. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Good morning, all. 
I hope you are well and warm. <laughs> Let's chat together in prayer. You are God the creator. You have loved this ancient land long before we know it existed or explore it. We thank you for the diversities of the country and its people. We are moved by its magnificent landscape, its clean valleys, and pleasant climate. For the richest of its mines and agricultural lands, and for the beauty of the forest, the cities, and ocean. We thank you for the first Australians who know and love this continent with an intimate and profound sensitivity. We acknowledge the courage and sacrifice of the early settlers and we celebrate the diversities of nationalities that now call Australia home. This is our first week of winter. We pray for those who leave early for work in the morning, finish work late to come home at night, and those who work in the extreme weather and conditions in the mines, the outback, or deep ocean. We remember those who are struggling to find a safe and warm place to stay each night. We pray that they are aware of your comforting presence and know that they are not alone and that they are remembered and loved. Lord, we pray for peace on earth. There are 32 countries currently at war. 32. May the world leaders and people in the positions of decision makings see its urgency in bringing peace to those war-torn countries to stop life loss needlessly and to realize the magnitude of disaster that affect by the war. We remember this morning those who are critically ill, chronic sickness, sad, depressed, or lonely, or those who are brave and patient when things are going wrong. We pray that they may be aware of your comforting presence and know that in your hands they will be looked after and loved. Lord, we pray for all whose life is saddened by the death of a loved one. Be with them in their loneliness and let them know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. For our congregations, we pray for our church. May all the activities, both present and in the future, carry out smoothly and effortlessly. We bless our church members, the church councils, and minister to have a good judgment and fairness that bring benefits to the majority of people under Almighty God's direction. May their eyes are clear and seen without any prejudice. Family is the smallest unit of the society, 
but the most important one. We are blessed with the family we have at home and here with our church family. We pray for them, we pray for them all to remain in good health, physically and mentally, and in good spirit. We also remember fragmented families, families that are doing it tough, and people who are in search of their long lost families. May Lord look after them, <clears throat> help them, and heal them. Let every person be courageous, be inspired, step out of their comfort zone, a comfortable place, optimize their talents, and give the priority to do more for others, for local communities, for society, and for the earth. Lord, give us the courage we need to be the best that we can be. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, um, um, hello again, Isabella. Isabella's with us every week. I just want to let you know who's interacting with us here online. Um, Here our praises is our, our final song today. Let's stand together and sing. Yeah. 
Lord, all that is good comes from you. So right now we offer ourselves. We offer ourselves giving thanks for your goodness in our lives. And we pray that the gifts that we bring, the gifts of our time, of our money and of our lives will be used for your work of love in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, go forth in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Honour all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Help the afflicted. Support the weak. And in so doing, love and serve our triune Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.